Hi guys, I hope you're having a wonderful weekend. Uh, for those that don't know me, my name is João Borges. I'm a dentist. I'm talking uh, to you from Lisbon. Uh, I've been dedicating my professional life for the past 16 years to exclusively to oral rehabilitation and aesthetic dentistry. And uh, I've been teaching about these topics for almost the beginning of my career. So almost 16 years. Um, and today I wanted to share with you an article that uh, I was reading today, um, a very interesting article published um, in the beginning of this year uh, from uh, German dentists, uh, among them uh, Frankenberger and uh, Roland Frankenberger, uh, Stefan Frey and uh, Jan Heito. Although the article, uh, the first author is uh, Uwe Blunk and uh, also together with them uh, Sabine Fischer. So uh, this article is about a um, uh, topic that uh, I uh, work a lot uh, with and I lecture a lot about this topic as well, ceramic laminate veneers. And it's interesting because they studied the effect of the preparation design and the ceramic thickness on fracture resistance and marginal quality in vitro. So, of course, as any article, we will discuss as well some limitations of the article, but I want to point out the interesting aspect of studying this particular um, uh, clinical aspects uh, so uh, interesting in our daily routine. So let me go through uh, with you into the, the article itself. So the objectives of the article were to uh, investigate the influence of five different preparation designs and two ceramic thickness on marginal quality and fracture resistance of ceramic laminate veneers. So what they did was they took uh, 80 uh, incisors and they randomly divided them into 10 groups uh, among uh, uh, five different preparations. Uh, and the preparations were uh, the non-prep uh, veneer, the minimally invasive, uh, exclusively enamel, the uh, semi-invasive, uh, taking as for 50% of the surface indenting, the uh, invasive one, 100% indenting, and last but not the least, semi-invasive with two class three composite restorations. Semi-invasive means that uh, half dentin and uh, adding to that two composite restorations in a class three configuration. Uh, they use the um, IPS inline veneers, two thicknesses, uh, L1 thin, so 0 0.2, 0 0.5, and L2 thick, 0 0.5 to 1.2. Uh, going through a little bit the introduction, um, the relevant question for us clinicians uh, that they point out is whether and to what extent should the enamel be maintained, even when this may reduce material thickness, or whether to rely on dentin adhesion and allow to create more space for the restoration. So this is interesting because it's the topic that I always talk about is how much should I prep? And the topic is what is minimally invasive for you? Uh, and minimally, minimally invasive for you should be of course preserving the structure the most you can, respecting all the uh, different outcomes, but most of all, the long-lasting result and stability of your veneer in what the dental adhesion is concerned. Uh, another clinical relevant question that they point out is whether the pre-existing resin composite restorations may have an influence on survival rate. Uh, this is also a question that we, we have in our courses uh, coming from the students which is, if I have a composite, what shall I do? Should I remove that composite prior to the, um, 
to the uh, preparation, the venue preparation, or should I uh, just let it there, or should I substitute and uh, keep it as uh, with the same configuration as a class three? So it's uh, uh, different approaches, but uh, at the end I will uh, give you some input about that as well. So the null uh, hypothesis were about one invasiveness of preparation designs, two the amount of dentin exposure during preparation, three the thickness the thickness of the veneer, four pre-existing resin composite restorations would have no influence on one a margin quality and fracture resistant veneers. So let's go through the materials and methods and try to understand among this uh, uh, method what could be maybe pointed out uh, and uh, a positive critic to the study. So the first thing is uh, the division in uh, five groups uh, I feel is uh, very interesting and I feel it's very positive as well but from what we learn from the graphic uh, uh, of the preparation as you see here and as we can understand we have uh, um, different areas of uh, uh, dentin exposure um, so it would be also interesting on the semi-invasive to understand as I've pointed out here whether the lack of enamel in the center and the enamel on the outer layer would be different from the design that they have here. So adding one an, another subgroup on the semi-invasive would also be interesting to study the outcome uh, and so maybe extend the study a little more, more and furthermore. Then another thing that is interesting is uh, the choice of the IPS inline ceramic veneer which is a lucid reinforced glass ceramic material. It's not the uh, more resistant one. Uh, on this uh, these, uh, thickness we are uh, in a quite interesting so to say mechanical risky situation. Um, so uh, Extending the study to other materials such as Emax, lithium desilicate, would also make it uh, uh, more interesting. But continuing to the materials and methods, uh, one thing that is interesting is the fact uh, that uh, uh, they use the monobond plus from Evoclar Vivident as they are using the very length veneer as the lutein composite. Uh, but they are using the Optibond FL. So the state of the art in adhesive uh, dentistry, uh, such as this uh, three-step etch and rinse adhesive, is still on for this case. It would be maybe uh, natural or common sense to uh, put uh, maybe the Adiz, uh, Adez from which is universal. Uh, this is from, uh, from Ivoclar um, into the study, but they just wanted to, to use uh, the, um, the state of the art, which normally is linked to the majority of the studies uh, on long term and longevity of uh, um, adhesives in this case. Um, of course, uh, nothing more into the the curing. One thing that is interesting on the ter thermal cycle cycling and also also the mechanical loading is the fact that uh, two million cycles were performed at 50 newtons and further one million uh, uh, over the double of the force. Um, it is also interesting in this general study to acknowledge that we are on an uh, opening and closing movement, uh, which uh, is, uh, of course, very, very controlled. But um, in my point of view, uh, 
uh, talking about what is the natural uh, movement and the natural situation in, inside of the stomatognatic system, we are in a very complex mechanical system. So uh, still we don't have that development in terms of uh, loading uh, and mechanical loading, but it will be, it will be really interesting to uh, have in the future maybe a difference in between the horizontal chewers and the vertical chewers because this is more linked to vertical chewers and not horizontal chewers. Um, so the pattern of mastication would also uh, contribute to uh, an interesting implication on the result of this study. Continuing, they have uh, uh, studied um, the margin of the veneers at the dentin enamel composite, so the lutein composite and the dentin enamel, and the ceramic composite interface. Okay, the resulting um, SAM scores were calculated for each criteria into the percentage of total margin length in enamel and dentin. So, what we could understand by the results uh, and is uh, very interesting. Uh, is the fact that uh, the marginal analysis and marginal quality was divided into um, four levels. Um, as you can see here, the marginal examination and the criteria was MQ1, MQ2, MQ3, MQ4. Q1 meaning no gap, no marginal ir irregularities or uh, Margin, margin not or hardly visible, uh, so perfect adaptation and uh, the highest uh, or the worst quality in terms of margin, MQ4 would be a severe gap, uh, slight or severe marginal irregularities and meaning porosities or bulge, etc, etc. So, um, after three million mechanical cycles, uh, the results uh, are interesting because uh, there's no differences, neither at the ceramic nor at the tooth interface. Uh, but nevertheless, visual inspections showed 20 tooth cracks, 11 chippings, 4 partial and 4 total fractures in 38 of 80 veneers. It's a lot. Um, uh, if you consider a chipping and a crack as uh, non-successful uh, treatment, uh, it's, a crack could be uh, discussable, but nevertheless, if you want perfect results, I would say that we are almost at a 50% uh, um, uh, bad outcome. Um, in the total number of veneers, so it, this is quite interesting. And what is interesting is that they have then ranked and provided different factors on the, uh, depending on the degree of alteration, of course, because you have, of course, a chipping in factor 2 and a fracture factor 6. And, of course, you have to consider that the earlier the defect, uh, the more severe it is. Uh, at the end, what they concluded when they just matched uh, not only the rank of the different factors as the time of the, the uh, when it happens, and they put it all together also in the timeline of the amount of loading cycles and um, uh, the, the time lapse of it. They uh, concluded, uh, they, they had as a result that both invasive groups with both ceramic thickness suffered most alterations when the veneers were thinner. It's quite interesting, let's go through that. So, let's see here the plot. So you see you have non-prep, here is about the percentage of par perfect margins. What do you have? You have non-prep and minimal invasive over 80%, over 80% of all the, the, the veneers in these groups presented perfect margins. So uh, it's quite interesting. 
and as you can see lower than 80 percent we have the semi-invasive and the invasive so the dentin is also linked or could be linked to uh, difference in uh, could be linked to a difference in the, ter in the uh, uh, perfection of the margin throughout time um, also if we go through then another view of the percentage of gaps uh, again the thin veneer over 100% uh, dentin showed almost 60% of gaps at, uh, uh, at uh, the marginal level so it's also interesting to understand how the thin is related in, in over dentin is related to this result uh, going back here no there's nothing more to get back sorry so um, finishing in terms of the uh, chipping cracks and uh, partial and total fractures this table is really interesting because we can understand that all the cracks all the cracks on thin veneers on uh, enamel approach enamel adhesion all the cracks happened after uh, a double load of the veneer so uh, meaning um, at 50 newtons we didn't have any crack whatsoever um, on the opposite side when you have a dentin uh, in the in the preparation area as you can see here uh, sorry in the beginning of the T t5 to t11 so rising until the uh, 3 million cycles um, the 2 million cycles at 50 newtons you have in the beginning the highest fractures you have not only partial fracture as cracks as total fracture as you can see here invasive is about the the most uh, um, the most uh, changes and alterations in and at the ceramic veneers so it's uh, interesting to have this in consideration so in the discussion what we can say is that this is a second study in the literature dealing with the thermomechanical loading of ceramic veneers in vitro this is really interesting um, despite all the evolutions, the advances accomplished uh, in adhesive dentistry, primarily dentin, is still often regarded as a potentially weak link compared to the clinical, unproblematical enamel adhesion. Um, so, facing the majority of reports about biodegradation, it will be probable that more exposed dentin should correlate with um a higher failure risk so this is an info that we can take out of this study but some limitations of this study in my opinion are first the study does not consider one clinical uh, aspect which has been proven to um, to provide a better uh, addition outcome and quality and strength throughout time uh, although we are just checking the marginal ad adaptation and also the cracks etc etc uh, the fracture resistance we could also be provided different results if we would consider the immediate dentin sealing as uh, uh, part of this protocol so immediate dentin sealing on the dentin areas and then all the protocol over it so I think this could also be something to point out and the limitation of the study as well uh, as uh, uh, we have been uh, told uh, that the um, the veneer as I told initially could have different behaviors if the dentin exposed is at the marginal level and the um, incisal edge or if it is in the center if I have 50% of dentin exposure in the center and all around uh, this core we have enamel maybe the result would be different as well 
So, uh, in, in what the fracture resistance is concerned, not the marginal adaptation, of course, because we are considering, of course, the marginal adaptation in Denton as one of the points to study in this, in this study. I'm just talking about how the fracture resistance could also be uh, um, change uh, towards this different positioning of the dentin. It is interesting that no statistically significant difference could be found between the results of the enamel and the dentin margins. So, despite what I've been saying, they have found this. So, this is quite interesting and I was not expecting um, uh, even as they say the long time of 3 million mechanical loading cycles. Um, and as they say, in a prelimin preliminary test, even after 2 million uh, uh, mechanical loading at 15 newtons, no deterioration was evaluated when compared the replica after each uh, 250,000 cycle. So, um, the thicker uh, discussing again uh, <clears throat> some of the results. The thicker laminates, um, for thicker laminates, the enlarged exposure of dentin did not have a negative consequence. The opposite, large dentin areas combined with thinner veneers proved to have higher risk of uh, uh, fracture. So, the extent of an enlarged dentin exposure portion is a clear disadvantage. Continuing the uh, analysis of the result, durable bonding to pre-existing resin composite should not be estimated to be clinical inferior. And another point that they uh, just analyzed here is the fact they didn't um, sandblast. The, as, they, as you can see here, no additional sandblasting was carried out and still the results was, were uh, favorable. So, um, they, the class 3 uh, composite restorations do not cause more fracture risk or marginal quality loss. This is quite interesting. But, as Marco Grechny uh, studied um, and uh, we will be and we will go through his article uh, in some weeks, um, when you have a class 3 restoration, it is mandatory that you take out all the composite and restore again. Because the timeline in between how long that restoration was in place, that composite restoration it was in place, and the success of that laminate is uh, really, really important. So, take out the composite, do a composite, prep over it, uh, and uh, and then cement uh, adhere your sorry adhere your laminate veneer. So this study showed as well that adhesively looted ceramic veneers, even under extreme loading by 100 newtons, still reveal stable margins and acceptable fracture resistance. So it means that uh, bonded ceramic laminate veneers represent an excellently stable way of restoring interior teeth. I just posted a while about veneers and I just told there's no way that I could now go back to the crowns I used to do in the beginning of my career in 2004 until 2008, maybe 2010. By 2009 I started doing veneers in a more straightforward indications, uh, ranging from very simple cases to very complex ones. and the outcome in the mid-long term is quite, quite interesting. I think you should go through that um, uh, uh, treatment plan or that indication or that option more often as it comes with much better results in my, my opinion and this, the opinion of some studies. The uh, weak ceramic system uh, of course is also evaluated here as I told in the beginning which is which is uh, um, the weak ceramic system at, um, is also put into place here as I've uh, talked about in the beginning of this evaluation of this article and um, uh, what I wanted to say is that um, uh, if you study this and you go further for Emacs 
materials, maybe it will be interesting to see how it goes in term in what the fracture resistance is concerned. So all groups showed high amounts of perfect marginal qualities, uh, fracture risk for thin veneers with no preparations, uh, characterized by significant dentin exposure, suffer statistically higher fracture risk compared to veneers um, in enamel. Pre-existing composite resin restoration had no adverse effects on outcome, uh, neither on margin quality or fracture resistance. So it is interesting to see that the null hypothesis, invasiveness prep designs, amount dentin exposure, thickness veneer, and pre-existing resin composites on all the margin qualities were confirmed. Um, the pre-existing resin composites uh, regarding the fracture resistance was also confirmed. So only the invasiveness, amount, dentin exposure and thickness of the veneer regarding the fracture resistance were rejected. So thank you so much for uh, taking the time to hear a little bit about this article, congratulations to our German colleagues, uh, Hugh Blanc, uh, Sabine Fischer, Jan Aito, uh, Stefan Frey, and uh, Roland Frankenberger. Uh, congratulations for this wonderful study. Uh, let's keep in touch. So follow John Bors Academy for more analysis, for more content. We'll be here for you. See you.